Once again, brethren, let's seek the face of God for present help from the Holy Spirit in our time together. Our Father, as we once more address you as our Father who is in heaven, the Father who delights to give good gifts to his children, we thank you for your wonderful promise that if we who are evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will you give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And so we come asking for present assistance of the Holy Spirit that I may know his help in delivering the material prepared for this hour that my brethren will know his help in giving them a discerning ear as they listen and seek to put all things to the test of your word and to hold fast what is good. Bless us then in our time together in this hour, we plead in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, one of the brethren pointed out that in my previous lecture, I did not highlight two points that are in your notes. They're found on page 8, under the relative dangers and potential disadvantages of excessive or exclusive consecutive expository sermons. Under the dangers to the hearers, I highlighted points 1 and 2, but I did not highlight points 3 and 4. Point three was this, our people may fail to see how the scriptures address all the burning issues of life. Uh, for example, when your people come deeply agitated about a national disaster and wonder, where do I fit this into biblical perspectives? How do I talk to my neighbors? It's a wonderful thing to give them something, and we have found over the years that some of the most useful tapes and then CDs have been after such a topical sermon in which you were able to put a national, a national issue into biblical perspective when everyone was talking about the Passion movie. I preached two sermons, the movie To See or Not to See, of something of a more positive nature that people could put in the hands of others, and then uh, another one on uh, what was lacking. I forgot the title, but that was more polemic for our own people, that they would not be inclined uh, to fill their minds and their eyes with that. So uh, if someone is just committed to consecutive exposition, I believe they are robbing their people of opportunities to see how the scriptures address all of the burning issues of life. And then point number four, uh, people sitting under an exclusive consecutive exposition can become hypercritical or unappreciative of any other method of preaching. It's hard to persuade true Christians blessed under a combination of all three kinds of preaching, persuade them uh, that they are not legitimate means of edification. They say, you don't know what you're talking about. I cannot but speak the things I've seen and heard and experienced in my own heart. So, so much for my little addendum of those two points. Now we come in this hour, just a brief word of review in addressing the matter of specific guidelines for the construction of our sermons. We've already in this unit uh, considered three divisions of our subject. First of all, I've given a description of the different kinds of sermons, the topical expository, the textual expository, and the consecutive expository. I've addressed the legitimacy of these three different kinds of sermons, and then the relative advantages and potential disadvantages of each one of these kinds of sermons. In this lecture, we begin now to address the fourth area of concern, namely the constituent elements of each kind of sermon. Now let me spend a little time in definition. What do I mean by constituent elements? Well, the word constituent refers to that which is necessary in forming or making up a whole. For example, 
in the olden days, if you had a stereo or hi-fi set, you would have a tuner amplifier, you would have a turntable, and your speakers. Those three things were the constituent parts of a stereo set. Now, over the years, it grew to where you had to have a tape deck and then a CD player, and who knows what's now been added. I don't know. I don't keep up with all of that technology. But when something is a constituent part of something, it is a part without which you don't have the thing. And then by elements, I'm referring to the basic or irreducible parts or principles of anything. For example, the elements of good health are generally genetics, diet, rest, exercise, and cleanliness. Those are the constituent elements, the fundamental things that go into good health. So we're going to be concerned with the constituent elements of each kind of sermon. And now I want to say a word about the process leading to the position that I will propose and will defend. One does not read long in the writers on the subject of the constituent elements of a sermon to discover that there are differing perspectives. The standard literature dealing with this subject indicates a great diversity of human judgment contrasted with what men write when they are dealing with the office of preaching, the place of preaching in the purpose of God, and they are dependent more upon the exegesis of specific passages of Scripture. But when we come to this matter of what are the constituent elements of any sermon worthy of the name, there is a diversity of perspective. For example, Dabney, in setting forth what he regards as the constituent elements of the sermon, he identifies five such elements and instructed his students to work with those five elements as a model in their sermon construction. Dabney writes, approaching then the particular topic of division, we find first a question as to the constituent parts which should compose the regular discourse. These I account to be the exordium or introduction, the exposition, the proposition, the main argument, and the conclusion. I shall define each of these, give my reasons for regarding them as essential members of the sermon, and add some instruction for composing them. So Dabney says, I believe there are five constituent elements to any and every sermon. But when we pick up Shed, we find he reduces the number to four and strongly urged his students to work with his model. Shed writes, in distinguishing the parts of a sermon, the same maxim applies as in distinguishing the different species of sermons. The distinction should be simple, generic, and as few as possible. We shall adopt the enumeration of Aristotle in his rhetoric and regard the sacred oration as made up of the following parts, namely, the introduction, the proposition, the proof, and the conclusion. So we're down from five to four. But when we turn to our good Baptist friend Broadus on the preparation and delivery of sermons, he brings us down to three. And I read now from Broadus, the analysis of a discourse which some writers have proposed is too artificial. Some of the parts which they distinguish are very often blended with other parts. The exposition, for instance, will often constitute the introduction. And in many cases, no formal exposition is necessary or appropriate. The proposition of the subject scarcely needs to be treated as a distinct part of the discourse. It is rather, if formally stated at all, a transition from the introduction to the discussion of the subject, and so belongs to both. 
the simplest and most natural analysis would seem to be that which gives three parts, namely the introduction, the discussion, including divisions, when these are made, and the conclusion. Now, why are these differences patent in these various men? The differences arise from the fact that there is such a large degree of interplay between rhetoric and the biblical idea of proclamation. That's the fundamental reason. When these men are constructing a theory or a theology of preaching with reference to the role and function of preaching itself, there is very little difference in their perspectives. This is due to the fact that biblical data are the foundational substance of their thinking. But when they descend to theories of sermon construction, they're relying more on the discipline or the art of rhetoric, that discipline that relies far more upon general revelation than upon the words of special revelation. So having considered examples of the differing perspectives on this subject and the fundamental reason for these differing perspectives, I will now attempt to give what I call a proposed resolution of these differences. When we consider these giants, and they are giants, and they're writing on this subject, and we see that they differ, what are we to do? Shall we throw up our hands in despair and say this matter of preaching is too elusive, we can't analyze it accurately, why try? Well, I answer no. I suggest we take a closer look at the differences among these men, and as we do, I believe we'll come to the conclusion that these differences in describing the constituent elements of a sermon are really a matter of how much detail should be considered in making the differing categories. For example, I might ask you, what are the constituent elements of this building? And you would say, well, the foundation, the walls, and the roof. Three constituent elements. Now, if we had a construction engineer here and said to him, what are the constituent elements of this building? He might say a foundation, framing, interior and exterior covering, sheathing, and shingles. What has he done? He's made divisions that break down elements of those fundamental three constituent elements, foundation, walls, and roof. And basically, this is what you find in these differences between Dabney, Shedd, Broadus, and others. And for reasons that I trust will become quite evident, the more streamlined version of Broadus will suffice for my lectures and I hope will suffice for your sermon preparation. The discussion part of the sermon varies so greatly in terms of whether we're preparing a topical expository sermon, a textual or consecutive expository sermon, that I'll have a separate lecture for the development of the discussion of each of the three kinds of sermons I will have a generic lecture or two on the introduction and the same with the conclusion. So at the end of the day, brethren, it's a proven fact that it's far better to have one of these theories of the constituent elements proposed by these three men as a working model with which to labor and modify it as we gain experience and competence in the construction of sermons. Now, it's obvious some men of unusual rhetorical ability may instinctively do what most will have to learn by conscious effort. But we would be presumptuous to assume that we fall into the category of native genius in the rhetorical art and that we have no need to think in terms of what constitutes the constituent elements of a sermon understand what they are, work with a model of the framework of those divisions,
and then look back upon our efforts and see if indeed all of the constituent elements were properly in place in our preaching. Now, Dabney was very conscious in teaching men of his day that some did not like this idea of having to work within such a framework. He writes, many preachers demur, and that means to have doubts and to hesitate in the face of a given object. Many preachers have doubts and reservations against the uniform requirement of all these parts as necessary members of a sermon. He says, they go on, he goes on to say, they sarcastically say such sermons are cast, all run in the same mold. And then Dabney goes after them and dismantles their specious reasoning, demonstrating that though we can alter and adapt without such a framework, it is unlikely that we will consistently construct sermons that have all of the constituent elements present for the edification of our people. Now, by way of a little aside, this threefold division in classic rhetorical literature is called the exordium, that's your introduction, and then your argument or discussion, and then your conclusion, the peroration. So when you find the words exordium, discussion, peroration, you'll understand what they mean, introduction, the body of the sermon, and the conclusion. To know these terms will help you to feel at home when you read those who've been influenced by classic rhetorical instruction. Now then we come to the matter of the introduction. We'll now proceed to consider this first vital part of sermon preparation, the introduction or the exordium. Generally speaking, an introduction, short or long, formal or informal, is a vital part of a good and edifying sermon. And no little effort must be expended to cultivate the art of constructing good, varied, and helpful introductions to our sermons. Good, varied, helpful introductions. Well, as we attempt to think our way through the subject, we'll consider various aspects of the construction of such God-glorifying, helpful, genuinely artful introductions. And we're going to do so under four major headings. And the first of these headings is the functions of the introduction. What function should be assigned to the introduction. Well, first of all, we need to understand and work with the conviction that the introduction is essentially preparatory to the burden of our message. In this sense, your introduction is your John the Baptist, sent forth to prepare the way of the Lord whom we trust will come to his gathered people with edifying grace and come to sinners in saving mercy in the preaching of the word. The function of the introduction can be viewed in the light of many analogies. It can be likened to an appetizer. An appetizer is meant to function in such a way as to cause the person sitting at the table to anticipate and to desire the main course. Or... Some of us who are old enough to remember what it was like to fly in piston-powered airplanes, we can remember what it was like when the aircraft was at the end of the runway, the brakes were locked, and the pilot gave full throttle in order to test the engines, and you felt that plane shake and vibrate, and you knew before long he was going to loose the brakes, and you would surge forward. Well, our introduction should be like revving the engines before those that are sitting in the gathered assembly of God's people. Or, I like this analogy, our introductions can be likened to the place and function of a porch attached to and leading into a well-designed house. So as we work our way through this material, we'll first of all consider the various functions of the introduction under 
four major categories. Number one, the introduction should direct the minds of our hearers to the subject or substance of the sermon. If the word is to profit our hearers, their minds must be engaged with us in the opening up of the scriptures. And it is our task tactfully and winsomely to draw the minds of our hearers in the direction of that which we propose to preach to them. If their minds are not engaged, we can do them no good. Now granted, they may not be engaged at the outset, and God may choose in his absolute sovereignty to draw their minds in a third of the way, half of the way through, or three quarters of the way through. I sat behind some young people Sunday. Their minds were not engaged for 30 seconds in the entire ministry of Pastor Hughes to a group of gathered young people. It was painful. I wrestled with whether to lean over and speak to them and for a number of reasons, I didn't do it. But it underscored for me again how critical it is, the word that this dear man of God was preaching with power and passion and earnestness. It did them not an ounce of good. Why? Their minds were not engaged for 30 seconds. Not for 30 seconds were their minds engaged, totally detached mentally. And we should look upon our introduction that with the blessing of God, it would direct the minds of the hearers to the subject or substance of the sermon. Now, we may do this by showing the relevance of our subject or text, the importance of it in respect to some aspect of their lives. However we do it, we must seek under God to have their minds turned in the direction of the burden of that which we are about to preach. That's what Peter did on the day of Pentecost. He heard the scuttlebutt about the interpretation of what was going on. And he says, men and brethren, give me your ears. We're not drunk. It's too early in the morning. Which, by the way, if being a teetotaler was part of being a sanctified apostle, he would simply have said, we're not drunk, we don't touch alcoholic beverages, it's displeasing to God, end of discussion. That's just a little aside. <laughs> All right. So that's the first function of an introduction, in order to get people's minds turned toward the truth that is the burden of our sermon. Secondly, the introduction should excite the interest of our hearers in the subject of the sermon. Not merely turn the mind, but excite the interest. You see Paul doing this in his introduction of his sermon there on Mars Hill in the Areopagus. And he engages the mind and quickens the interest of those who are before him. It is one thing to get our hearers to turn their mental heads in our direction. It's another thing to secure their fixed attention. Hence, the challenge of the introduction is to excite interest so that our people are convinced it is worth their while to attend to what we have to say. Bishop Ryle has a marvelous quote uh, in this regard, with respect to uh, what an introduction can do. I've got it here. There it is. Okay. Yes, this is Daniel Rollins, and it's talking about uh, Rollins' use of introductions. Rollins' mode of preaching was peculiar to himself, inimitable. Methinks I see him now entering in his black gown through a little door from the outside of the, to the pulpit, and making his appearance suddenly before the immense congregation, his countenance was in every sense adorned with majesty, and it bespoke the man of strong sense, eloquence, and authority. Describes his physical appearance. And then when he makes his appearance in the pulpit, he quotes a verse. Then Rollins would stand up, read his text distinctly in the hearing of all, the whole congregation were all ears and most attentive, as if they were on the point of hearing some evangelic and heavenly oracle, and the eyes of all the people were at the same time most intensely fixed upon him. He had at the beginning of his discourse some stirring, 
striking idea, like a small box of ointment which he opened before the great one of his sermon, and it filled all the house with its heavenly perfume as the odor of Mary's alabaster box of ointment at Bethany, and the congregation being delightfully enlivened by the sweet odor, were prepared to look for more of it from one box after the other throughout the sermon. Beautiful analogy. It was like opening up a box of choice fragrance. And then Shedd tells us in his instruction concerning the matter of the introduction, the introduction in its nature is preparatory. It does not lay down any truth. It does not establish any doctrine. It simply prepares the way for the fundamental parts and necessary matter of the discourse. And then he makes an allusion to secular oratory. The preacher, unless he's been exceedingly unfaithful to himself and his calling, may presume upon the goodwill and the respect of those listening to him and need not waste time or words in endeavoring to secure a favorable attention to himself as a man. However, it is necessary sometimes that the preacher in his introduction should conciliate his audience in respect to his subject. And then he gets specific. If it's this type of a message, this type of a message, he must seek to turn the mental head and fix the attention of the mind upon that which he is to preach. Then a third function of the introduction is that it should warm the affections or emotions of our hearers to the subject or substance of the sermon. We will often come to our preaching brethren like Elihu. He said, my heart is like wineskin about to burst and I must speak. We've been living with the subject. We've been living with the passage. Our minds are full of it. Our affections have been kindled by it, either with holy joy, with a sense of solemnity, or at times even great dread. But our people do not have that emotional engagement. And whenever we express levels of emotion that are at great disparity from the emotional state of our people, they feel uncomfortable and threatened. This, your own experience, will validate this. If I were to come into this lecture, lectern, uh, in one of these lectures, having uh, heard something from home that greatly gripped me emotionally or from some other source, and then I just stood up and pow, your first reaction is to draw back. Your emotions have got to be kindled to the thing that's burning, your, the, the emotions of your people kindled to the thing that is burning in your own heart. And again, you won't find modern writers dealing with much of this because they don't understand the place of emotions in preaching or the emotional affinity with people that is necessary in preaching. But the old writers, they understood it. Listen to Dabney. If the speaker has done his duty to himself and to his subject, he has mastered it by previous study and comes to the pulpit with his soul inspired and warmed with it. He cannot assume that his hearers are in this animated state. It may even be true that they are ignorant what his subject is to be. Now this contrast between their state of feeling and his is unfavorable at the beginning to the institution of an active sympathy. When he is all fire and they are yet ice, a sudden contact between his mind and theirs will produce rather a shock and a revulsion than sympathetic harmony. His emotion is, to their quietude, extravagance. He must raise them first a part of the way toward his own level. And here he is dealing with the subject of our introduction and its function. So function number three is that of warming their affections to the subject 
that we are going to preach. Now, Phelps also makes that same observation. I will not read that quote. You have it in your notes. But then fourth, the introduction should sometimes, sometimes secure the goodwill of the hearers toward the preacher as a man and as a servant of God. Hopefully, as we labor in pastoral situations and we are there for a lengthy period of time, you become known and becoming known, you are respected and known and respected, you are loved. There should be few times when you need to use an introduction in order to win the affections of the people to yourself. However, you may occasionally preach in circumstances where you are neither known nor loved and where people might have some reason to be prejudiced against you. And the function of an introduction is to warm the affections of the people to your persons. Because if they don't receive you, they won't receive your message. Jesus understood that. He said, whosoever receives you, receives me. But it was receiving the you of the apostles in their apostolic proclamation. And if we don't receive the person of the proclaimer, we won't receive the message that he proclaims. And in that quote of Phelps that you have in your notes, there is a marvelous and very telling illustration of two men that understood this and how they won the affections of people who might ordinarily be indisposed to listen to anything from them. So there's the fourfold function of the introduction. Now then, general guidelines for the construction of an introduction. I want to propose six such general guidelines for the composition of our introductions. And we'll take uh, several of them uh, this, this morning. First of all, under ordinary circumstances, don't force the composition of your introduction until the substance of the sermon is well in hand. Don't force the composition of your introduction until the substance of the sermon is well in hand. Since the sermon is the house, it's only when the house is constructed that you will know precisely where and how to construct your porch. Since the main entree is the heart of a good meal, let that entree dictate the kind of appetizer that you're going to choose. If the introduction should be clear and suitable at the outset of your preparation, then compose it, but don't force it. This is particularly true in consecutive expository preaching where you are almost forced to leave the introduction to the end of your preparation. Dabney, from these rules you will easily infer that the introduction must be short relatively, relatively to the whole sermon. A long and ambitious exordium is ruinous to all subsequent effect. It wastes time. It consumes the preacher. He tells all the bad things. But then he goes on to say, for this as well as other reasons, it is well that the young preacher should not attempt to write his introduction until the discussion has either been written or at least expanded in his own mind. Sound counsel about the benefit of waiting until the sermon in its discussion part is well in hand. Phelps gives similar counsel, but then a qualifying word at the end. Therefore, do not compose the introduction till the plan of the whole discourse is outlined. Write out a plan of the entire sermon from text to finish. Adjust the form of the proposition. Devise the outline of the argument. Invent the chief illustrations. Shape the application. Decide upon the method of closing in a word. Get everything before you which is to be introduced. Put it on paper. 
If your mind needs this, as many do, the help of the eye, then you know what the exordium or introduction ought to be, and you can set about it intelligently, and you will save time by this preliminary work of getting ready to work. Why not then write the body of the sermon in full before composing the exordium? Then he goes on to qualify that, that in some instances it would be wise to perhaps write the introduction earlier in our sermon preparation. My own experience has been that I could work rather diligently and profitably on the more technical elements of exegesis, structure, the things that went into the body of the sermon, but the creative element necessary for good, varied, and that's a key word when you're in one place for a long time and you're doing consecutive exposition to have varied introductions and not just stand up, this is sermon number 23 on the Gospel of Mark. This is sermon number 24 on the Gospel of Mark. No. And the creative element I found late Saturday night was gone. I just don't have much. I'm a morning man. And I would leave a blank place on page number one of my four pages of handwritten notes that I generally carried into the pulpit, confident that early Sunday morning as I was praying in the sermon that I would get a sense of an appropriate introduction and I cannot count the times it would be into the hundreds of times when that would happen. And I found that for me, leaving my introduction till my more fruitful time and that final praying in of the message was the best time for me. So I find myself very sympathetic to this counsel, but each man has got to find how he works best with these matters. But that would be my counsel in general guideline for the construction of your introduction. Under ordinary circumstances, don't force the composition of your introduction until the substance of the sermon is well in hand. Then secondly, be sure to compose your introduction of something pertinent to or that comfortably leads into the substance of the sermon. And here uh, Dabney's counsel is good. This member of discourse is the last in which the preacher should indulge in vague commonplaces. For it is now that he's seeking to make a good first impression and stir the sluggish interest of his hearers. But indulgence in disconnected introductions will incline him to these trite generalities. And the final issue will be that he will be found commencing every discussion, however different the subjects, with the same stale ideas. Some preachers infringe the rule required a connect, requiring a connected exordium by affecting to begin with some topic which appears as remote as possible from the text in order that they may exhibit their ingenuity by establishing an unexpected line of connection between their introduction and their text. While the audience are wondering how in the world he's going to get around from his introduction to his text, he astonishes them by a gyration about the little circle of his knowledge which leads him to the desired point. Every sensible hearer detects vanity as the motive of this display. Let the introduction never be far-fetched. There's some men who think that if they've heard an interesting story, worse yet, if they've heard a stale joke, that somehow this will prove to the people that he's a good guy and a nice guy, and it has absolutely no connection whatsoever with the substance of the sermon. We must make it an inflexible rule that our introductions will always be composed of something pertinent to or that comfortably leads into the substance of the sermon. Third word of counsel, do not allow your introduction to steal from the main substance or body of the sermon. 
When a man spends 10 or 15 minutes with his introduction, unless in the example of consecutive exposition and you've been away from the given book for a period of weeks and you want to do a general overview, your introduction will make that plain to the people that this is what you're going to do as an essential part of the sermon. You're going to do a more detailed overview of the previous expositions of that particular book. But generally, don't steal from the main substance or body of the sermon. And then the fourth word of counsel is this. Your introduction should be both modest and realistic. Do not promise more in your introduction than you have reason to believe you will be able to give your people in the bulk of the sermon. It would be disappointing to sit down to a special meal and to be served an exquisite shrimp cocktail appetizer in a frozen glass only to be served warmed over hash for the main course. You say, the appetizer led me to believe something better than my hash. Well, don't have your people sitting there saying, that was a shrimp cocktail appetizer, but man, this wasn't even warm hash. It was cold hash. So, be modest, realistic. One man has suggested that our introduction should be marked by the words simplicity, modesty, fitness, and suggestiveness. I like that. Simplicity, modesty, fitness, and suggestiveness. Sangster wrote as follows, the idea of some preachers that all sermons must have an introduction is nonsense. If the subject demands it, it must have it. But be glad when it's quite unnecessary and you can step swiftly into your text. Years ago, I used to pass on my way to my church a wee little house with an enormous porch. I can see it in my mind's eye as I write. Great Corinthian pillars complete with acanthus leaves supported a Baroque portico which would have been giving, able to give shelter from the rain for half a platoon of soldiers. On the other side of this enormous porch was something like the cheapest kind of a council house. The Brits who are here will know what a council house is. I always smiled as I went by. It reminded me of two things. The man who began to build and had not wherewith to finish, and also certain sermons I've heard. All introduction, ornate splendor around the door, and next to nothing on the other side. The little house by itself could be warm and welcoming and snug. But after that ridiculous porch, dot, 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 exclamation point. I don't know how to verbally convey that. This is the point we're making. It should be modest. It should be realistic. And Sangster reminds us of that. And so does Dabney, who writing on the same subject tells us, while the thought of the exordium should by no means be trivial or uninteresting, Neither should it be overly ambitious. It should not vie in splendor with all that are to succeed it, lest it should raise too much promise to the expectation of the hearers. The impression which they carry away from a sermon is usually that produced by its concluding parts. If you fail there to fulfill the promise of your outset, the pleasing surprise which you gave them in commencing will not cause them to pardon you the disappointment. This then should be one of the marks of our introductions. And then the fifth word of counsel is the introduction should be as brief as possible while still accomplishing its task. As brief as possible here again, Sangster's counsel is helpful. We have admitted that some sermons require an introduction. It is just not possible to step into every subject in a phrase, but the introduction must be as short as it possibly can. One must labor, if necessary, to have it so. Cut into the subject with sharp, terse phrases. Resist as you would resist the devil, that awful tendency to drag. 
Let the people feel in your whole manner that you have something most important to say and you simply cannot waste words. Here is a man covetous of every moment he has. That spirit does not militate against decent reverence and cannot be confused with rush and breathlessness at the throne of the word of God. That's the counsel of Sangster. And then Dabney gives us further counsel along the same line. From these rules, you will easily see that the introduction must be short relative to the whole sermon. A long and ambitious exordium is ruinous to all subsequent effect. It wastes time, it consumes the preacher's strength, it exhausts the sensibilities of the people before the stage of the sermon for which it is needed. Young writers, we can put preachers, are usually inclined to dilate too much upon their preliminary topics. That's because they are zealous for thoroughness and being inexperienced in the work of composing sermons. They do not know how largely the whole discourse will grow upon their hands when amplified in the same proportion. It is far better to abridge the introductory parts than to be compelled by an ill-judged waste of time there to mar the more important thoughts near the close. For this, as well as other reasons, it's well that the young preacher should not attempt to write his introduction until the discussion has either been written or at least expanded in the mind. So our introduction, brief as possible while still accomplishing its task, and finally, the introduction ought to be interesting and where possible, arresting. Interesting and where possible, arresting. And here I quote Sangster. It will not always be possible to achieve this, and one ought not constantly to try to achieve it in the same way. One must have variety here as elsewhere in preaching, and shock tactics can be overdone. Yet people can be arrested sharply by other than shock tactics. There is a piquant opening that's pleasant smelling or tasting. A sharp paradox can arrest. An incisive question thrust at the heart of the text. The moment it is uttered can do it. It can be done by contradicting the text immediately from the superficial standpoint of worldly wisdom and then fighting back to the Bible truth again or if one does not contradict it, can cast doubt upon it in an opening phrase. None of these are oratorical tricks. They've been called that by the lazy and incapable, but their praise is criticism and their criticism praise. The serious craftsman can afford to ignore such comments. He has the awful task of making the word of God live to men and women, who've been busy all week seeking the bread of this life and who even in the sanctuary find it hard to keep their minds on God and holy things. He must help them in every wholesome way he can. If he can get an arresting beginning, he may have their awed attention the whole time and be able securely to hide the truth of God deep in their hearts." And then he gives some examples, one of which I found very telling. They speak of the visit. I wouldn't know who Sparhawk Jones was, but apparently he was well known in his day. And he took as his text, Is thy servant a dog that he should do this thing? After a moment's pause, he began crisply, Dog or no dog, he did it. Can you imagine sitting there, that text is read, and the preacher looks you in the eye and says, dog or no dog, he did it, and then plunged into the sermon. So uh, I think that counsel is wise and helpful counsel wherever possible. They should be interesting. They should be arresting. Well, I think this is a good breaking point, and then we'll take up in the next lecture suggested materials for composing the introduction. All right, let's pray together. Our Father,
we acknowledge that in wrestling with these things, we are dealing with matters that are so elusive in some areas, and yet, by your grace, we do desire to grasp the principles that ought to be operative in our construction of our sermons, not to any other end, but your glory in the salvation of sinners and the edification of saints, the strengthening of our churches. We have no desire to earn the reputation of being great or clever preachers, but, oh God, we want to be useful preachers. And we pray that we will leave no stone unturned in pursuing those things that will make us more effective and useful preachers to your people. So help us as we continue to wrestle with these things. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.